Hello and welcome everybody to this presentation of using mask-free NIV for spontaneously breathing patient spontaneously breathing COVID-19 patients presented by Dr. Kirk Hinckley and Vapotherm. This is a live presentation. That's why I screwed up reading it. A brief clinical presentation disclaimer. Any clinical recommendations provided herein are solely those of the speaker as Vapotherm does not practice medicine or provide medical advice. Practitioners should refer to full indications for use and operating instructions of any product reference here before use. Vapotherm High Velocity Therapy is a tool for treating respiratory distress in spontaneously breathing patients. Dr. Hinckley has been a board certified emergency medicine physician for over 11 years. He's emergency medicine medical director of Commonwealth Health EMS, where he maintains clinical oversight of several EMS units. And he practices as an emergency medicine physician in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Dr. Hinckley is also the director of emergency department education at Vapotherm. He went to medical school on a United States Air Force scholarship and served in operations Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom as critical care air transport team leader and flight surgeon. Dr. Hinckley is an experienced user of HVNI. We're proud to have him here speaking in this presentation of using mask-free NIV for spontaneously breathing COVID-19 patients, presented by Dr. Kirk Hinckley and Vapotherm. Dr. Hinckley, first, and I, I surprise you with this one every time, thank you for your service to our country, uh, and thank you also for being here to present. Uh, the stage is yours. Absolutely, thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Hello, guys, and uh, happy Wednesday. I'm coming to you from Northeastern Pennsylvania, where it's a balmy 40 degrees. Um, and uh, sitting here in my house, and I'm sure you, a lot of you are too. So what I'd like to do today is just give a rundown of using mask-free on IV. That's the Vapotherm technology. It's for use in spontaneously breathing patients, and of course it can be used and has become uh, or come to the forefront in use on COVID-19 patients. So I know there's a lot of you that have a, a variable level of experience with COVID. Um, I know I've only had you know, a trickle of patients uh, up to this point, but I have taken care of a number of them. There's some of you that have taken, you know, your hospitals are inundated with these, but um, I will tell you this. So there's a lot of data out there and it continues to flow in, but the good news is it's been pretty stable for, uh, well, if you consider a week stable, it's been stable for about a week. Um, and there's a couple questions that we get asked all the time, and I hope to answer, for, answer those questions for you and do it with all the best available evidence. So those questions are, is it safe? Is it effective? Why shouldn't I just intubate these patients? Well, you know, we're learning so much and hopefully we can uh, share some of the data with you guys today so you can make the best decisions for your patients. All right. So as long as I can. There we go. All right. So who am I? Um, I think Mark did a nice job of introducing me, but I am a part time employee of Vapotherm. I'm the director of ED education here. But again, I am also a practicing ED physician. If, uh, if uh, my voice starts to trail off a little bit, that's because I'm post, uh, post night shift. I worked till 7 a.m. this morning here in Pennsylvania. Um, didn't have any COVID patients last night, thankfully, but uh, um, it's nice to see some of our, our um, chronic flow starting to trickle back in. So Vapotherm doesn't practice medicine, but I do, and I hope to share some of my experiences with you. I um, hope to kind of blast through these slides pretty quickly so that there's plenty of time to answer questions. So, um, you know, what are we going to do today? So we're going to overview COVID-19 and all the clinical guidelines, the, the different organizations that stand behind those. We're going to review the transmission risk, particularly with regard to transmission risk to the healthcare workers like yourselves. We're going to look at the the proper protective measures, the PPE that could reduce the transmission risk um, during high velocity nasal insufflation, which is Vapotherm. And then we're going to discuss HVNI, Vapotherm, in the context of, of COVID management. Um, and in doing so, we're going to review most of the pertinent studies to this. 
Um, a lot of these are very up to date with some of them published as recently as maybe last week. Um, I will tell you this, there is one thing that is certain as we kind of um, muddle our way through the initial stages of, of COVID and that is that the rules have all changed. This is nothing like what we've seen before and it's time to kind of open our minds and, and learn how to take care of patients um, in a new way. So I, I thought I'd start with a quick presentation. And this, this is a patient that you'll all see, and, and you'll see that it is directly applicable to COVID. So 65-year-old with, with COPD, comes in with cough, fever, shortness of breath. This one just happens to be um, tested previously positive for COVID-19. They come in pretty significantly hypoxic, um, depending on her severity of COPD, 82% might not be too terrible. Um, and unlike a lot of the COPD or the uh, COVID-19 patients out there, this one has scatter wheezes and crackles on exam. So if you look at that picture, there's a lot of things that we have to do differently nowadays, right? So first of all, PPE for the provider. Second of all, what can we do to protect ourselves from that patient besides PPE? Uh, most notably, and we'll get to this, um, placement of a surgical mask on all our patients coming to the emergency department. So what is COVID-19? Um, I think a lot of us have a good foundation and understanding of what this is. And this is, this is an adaptation of a common virus or a coronavirus, right? The second most common cause of, of the cold, right? Common cold virus. However, this is most closely related to the SARS virus that we had years ago. And that's why its formal name is SARS-CoV-2, the second of the SARS virus, severe, um, pre presenting with uh, severe acute respiratory distress, right? And COVID-19, 19, of course, refers to the year that it was discovered in Wuhan, China, being December of last year, 2019. Of course, our pandemic uh, started here in the U.S. about mid-March, um, mostly in New York City, um, followed closely by cities like New Orleans, then Detroit, and then out on the West Coast. So what are you seeing with coronavirus? Um, we've heard all along, hey, that these patients can present very atypically, but what are the most common presenting symptoms? And, and they're just like any cough or cold symptom, right? So upper respiratory disease. And that would be fever, cough, fatigue, um, some sputum production, a little bit of shortness of breath, short, sore throat, myalgias. And then one of the things that's, that's not on there and will be present in about 10 to 15 percent of patients is, is GI symptoms. So I know that in a number of my COVID positives, we have had uh, diarrhea as a presenting complaint. Of course, it's really interesting to see these, these so-called silent hypoxics that come in um, I know my first one that I saw had a SAT of 80%, had her chief complaint, it was mild cough, um, body aches, and uh, profound diarrhea. So I was kind of shocked to see her resting O2 saturation at 85%. And then when I walked her, it was 80% 80, 80 room air SAT. So of course, uh, she went on to have a pretty significant COVID pneumonia on CT scan and all the hallmarks of the lab work that you guys have probably um, grown to know pretty well. Um, some of the things that I've used to kind of keep myself up to date on this and, and the symptoms that people are seeing is the EM Crit uh, website, also the EM Wrap weekly updates. I think they've done an excellent job um, of, of really summarizing some of these case reports, make sure that we uh, that we, we pick up some of the more atypical presentations. I know on EMCRIT in particular, they, they uh, reported a patient with knee pain that uh, resulted from a syncope, which of course uh, resulted from pro profound hypoxemia. So disease severity and prevalence. So we know that there's a lot of these people walking around in the community that have mild or moderate, mild or moderate symptoms, most of which do not uh, present to hospitals, right? Um, of those, about 14% are going to develop severe disease. Severe disease are those that are going to require hospitalization and, and most particularly oxygen support. Of those presenting to the hospital, only about 5% will require ICU admission. 
right? So these are people that are going to require more than just your nasal cannula oxygen. And those, those patients can be really profoundly sick, right? We're seeing all kinds of different presentations. And the one thing that we know for certain is that there is no typical presentation of this disease. So you can have people that have um, ARDS, they can present with uh, hypertension or can present conversely with hypotension. They can have DIC, they can have multi-organ failure. Um, in particular, there's a profound uh, kidney failure that's associated with this. Think creatinines on the order of 15 or above. Um, think D-dimers in some of these patients with microthrombotic disease of over 1,500. And right now, the estimates on the r naught or the spreadability of this disease are estimated, at least in this country, at about 2.2. So 2.2 patients are going to be infected by any, any positive person. So I know that there's certainly numbers out there. There's situations that are reported, particularly the, the most recent one where they're investigating a patient and that infected, what, nine or 10 others in, in a small restaurant. So, um, all right. So, what did we hear early on? And I know back middle of March, I was out at the NAMDARC meeting, National Association of Medical Directors for Respiratory Care, out in Scottsdale, Arizona, with all the top pulmonologists in the country, certainly feeling out of place as an ER doctor. And the word on the street at that time, coming out of New York, New Jersey, was, hey, you got to intubate these patients early because they're really tenuous, they're profoundly hypoxic, they need to be on vents. And you heard um, Governor Cuomo from New York and others screaming for ventilators because this is the only thing that was going to save these patients, right? And they were using an extremely low threshold um, to go ahead and intubate those patients. And at the time, it just made me scratch my head. I'm like, really? Like, who here, or who amongst my colleagues would be willing to be intubated if they were only require their hypoxic at six liters nasal cannula, right? Like we have so much more to offer patients. Does it really make sense to intubate them? Even with these transmissibility concerns and aerosol generating procedures and all these different things that weigh in on it, does it really make sense to intubate patients if they're only requiring more than six liters nasal cannula oxygen? And of course, since then, we've really developed a lot more of a knowledge base and a, a better understanding of how COVID is different and why it demands uh, novel treatment. So updated guidelines. So um, over the last few weeks, the, the major health organizations have really, um, we'll say trickled in with their di different recommendations. If you looked at World Health Organization, if you looked at SCCM, if you looked at CDC in particular, their guidelines were really all over the board early on, right? A lot of them had this mantra of early intubation. And what has happened over the last month or so is these organizations have fallen into lockstep with their recommendations, right? So, um, CDC now mirrors very closely the Society of Critical Care and Medicine. So if you follow the SCCM Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, which have, have been pretty stable now for a couple of weeks, that is basically where the WHO, the CDC kind of fall, right? And they have been backed by uh, knowledge that they gained from the Australians, from the Italians, from the Germans, and, and of course from the Chinese as well. So um, if you look down at the bottom of that slide, yeah, the, the low acuity patients, you can manage them easily. And it is a recommendation to manage them on um, regular nasal cannula oxygen. Anybody of moderate acuity, people that are more significantly hypoxic, they're going to benefit from non-invasive technologies, in particular, the high velocity and high flow nasal cannula oxygen. And this has really come to the forefront in the last few weeks. And I guess, I mean, that is why most of you are listening to this talk in the first place, right? And of course, if, if those means aren't working, or if you happen to be in Italy where there's a helmet CPAP, you might use um, other non-invasive means or non-invasive positive pressure means um, before you would ever end up in mechanical ventilation, right? And 
And so as we gain more knowledge, we know that intubation has not benefited these patients. So why not intubate? So first of all, in, in terms of risk to you and I, like if you're a respiratory therapist, if you're a critical care nurse, if you're a, a clinician that does airway management, one of the most significant things that you can do is intubate a patient, right, in terms of your own risk, right? So we will talk about later on in this, in this um, presentation, we'll talk about aerosol generating procedures, but I can tell you the riskiest ones are intubation, extubation, and any circuit breaks that might happen in the routine care of this patient, right? So there's routine care that includes suctioning. All right, we, we can talk about aerosol treatments, which have really fallen out of favor for this reason. But think about some of the novel ways to take care of them or, or the proning techniques and how risky it might be to have a cir circuit disconnect while you're trying to prone a patient using maybe, if you don't have a, a proning bed, you might have six people there helping you, um, certainly within a, a meter of the patient's airway, um, and that presents a significant um, risk. So how about resource constraints, right? Like remember Cuomo and asking for all these ventilators. Well, there's still only a certain number of ventilators and there's only a certain number of places in your hospital that can take care of them, right? They do take, um, you know, it takes specialized staff. It requires more nursing, more respiratory attention. Um, and a specific site to take care of them. Like I know in my emergency department, we can't care for vented patients in more than a couple of rooms. And so um, those resource constraints are really the things that are, are leading um, away from intubation, as well as what we've learned about these patients' uh, physiology is that it just doesn't benefit them. And we'll talk about that here shortly. So, um, what did we what did we find out first? Well, in China, and, and if you believe their data, um, you know, and, and I will tell you that 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 some of this stuff is almost unbelievable, but their mortality rates early on, especially in the Hubei province where, where Wuhan was or is, they reported mortality rates as high as 81%, right? So think about that. If you knew that there was an 80% chance that you weren't going to make it. Would any of you intub wish to be intubated yourselves, or would you intubate your colleagues knowing this, knowing that there is an 8 in 10 chance that they wouldn't come off that vent? Of course, we probably are going to do better. And you'll see down below there that the U.S. ICU mortality is somewhere between 50, uh, 50 and 52% is what quoted here by, the, by an article from the New England Journal just published here in early April. So anywhere from 50 to 80% of these patients are not going to make it. All right. So it is a virtual death sentence to go on a ventilator. And so really it needs to be used as last resort rather than first line treatment. All right, next slide. So some of the some of the data and the way that we've changed our understanding started to trickle in from China also. And this Jiangsu province, which is on the eastern shore or kind of due east of Hubei, um, they started to do things a little bit differently. And what if you look at the numbers there, their their cure rates of their confirmed cases and, and their death rate was actually significantly better than what was going on in Wuhan at the time. All right. And, and you look at, at the, the citation down there that this is still from this year. Right. This is this is pretty early stuff. Uh, March 7th, 2020. Um, and how were they getting these numbers? And, and so they came up with a strategy that, that looked at early recognition of the patients that were high risk to become critically ill. And then they had early intervention guidelines that were run by intensivists to prevent the progression of the disease, right? So it makes sense. So what did they do? Um, and so the early recognition, they, they screened their patients twice daily, and they did that using vital signs and O2 sats. And then their early warning system was comprised of four factors that identified high-risk patients. And those were their patient's age, the lymphocyte count, their degree of ox oxygen supplementation, and then their evolution of any pulmonary infiltrates on chest x-ray. 
All right. So they took those and then the, then they implemented early interventions. And what were what were the early interventions? So well, that's what we're talking about today. So everything was aimed at preventing early endotracheal intubation. So they implemented high flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy or uh, NIV positive pressure or CPAP, um, and they used that. Um, at, opposed to the intubate first strategies, right? So they were providing high levels of non-invasive oxygen to support these patients. And what they saw is that um, a much smaller percentage ended up on mechanical ventilation, all right? So less than 1% versus the national average of almost two and a half percent. And that their, um, in, in when it was all said and done, their mortality rate was, was significantly better. So, all right. So how about in the United States? What have we seen? And, and honestly, probably the best and, and, and most stable of the guidelines that we've seen is the Society for Critical Care Medicine. They published their um, Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. And if we'll, we'll look at their flow diagram here, but what they, what they um, um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought here. But um, so they had a couple of, of different strategies. And what they wanted to do was keep patients norm, normal oxic, and they wanted to support their oxygen saturations above 95%. So they quote 96%. And they're doing that by different, um, different strategies. But one of the most prominent is the early implementation of high velocity or high flow nasal cannulas over oxygen therapy because of the success that they're having in providing that, um, that improvement in the patient's oxygen saturations. Um, they also do recommend trials of NIPPV such as CPAP or BiPAP if the high flow, high velocity nasal cannula is not available or um, if they're maybe not doing so well on that or, but are not yet ready to be intubated, right? So, the reason that they're suggesting that is the transmissibility concerns that are associated with mass-based therapies, all right? And as we, as we talk about the TRAN article and, and others later on, you'll see why, um, why these guidelines are kind of trending away from non-invasive um, positive pressure, all right? So here's a flow diagram I mentioned. If you just follow right down the center of this thing, um, yeah, if the patient needs to be intubated, and I think we all know what that means clinically, um, then you're going to do it, right, right off the bat. But if they tolerate supplemental oxygen and they are not saturating to the guidelines, they're going to consider the use of high flow nasal cannula, high velocity, vapotherm therapy early in the treatment of these patients, all right? So um, right below that is, hey, are they not tolerating the high flow, the high velocity? And if so, right then, hey, consider your um, endotracheal intubation, and you basically kick back over to the left side. If not, then they then they want you to to think about a trial of NIPPV. Um, there is different strategies out there for that, and I know that um, CPAP has really been favored over BiPAP. Uh, in Italy, of course, they're using the helmet CPAPs with with better success and tolerability by the patients, while also having um, De decreased risk to the healthcare providers. Um, all right, so how do we know, how do we know if they're not tolerating the high flow, high velocity? There have been some studies out there that looked at this. If you look at ROCA at all, and I don't know if that is, I might go back here. Nope, it's not there. But ROCA at all talked about a um, an index called the ROX, R-O-X, which is basically the O2 SAT divided by the FO2, FiO2. So your SAT divided by your FiO2 and all of that divided by the respiratory rate. And then they have different numbers. And if those numbers are really small and they're falling, then you really wanna consider doing something more, okay? And they predict, those, those indexes are gonna predict failures on high flow, high velocity. All right, so how do we know, like who are the good candidates for which tool? 
Um, and I think if we just go through some of the patient rec management or treatment recommendations and some of the studies that are out there, um, we can get a good idea. And most recently, this is from the first week of April in the new journal of ASEP, the journal of JSEP Open. And this is written by um, a couple of well-known ER docs, namely first author on this is Jessica Whittle. She's out of University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. Um, she is it, it is um, relevant to mention her name because before she was an ER physician, she's a PhD virologist, right? So who knows better than this? And also the, the second author on this is a, is a Charlie Atwood, who's a pretty prominent pulmonologist, a former president of NAMDARC. And then third author, I, I guess probably most of you would know Al Sakiti. And so they went through and they gave their treatment recommendations for respiratory support of patients with COVID. And um, what, they, what they decided is that it was their recommendation that high flow nasal oxygen or HVNI technology lit vapotherm is preferred with patients with higher oxygen requirements. You can consider use of NIPPV or, or CPAP BiPAP um, but it is associated with higher nosocomial transmission risk. We've talked about that before. Um, now you see the, the next bullet is to proceed to mechanical ventilation for those who do not respond. What they say is that um, there's a one hour decision period where the patient is closely monitored and watched for things like rocks index and others. But honestly, I, I think I would use um, just my clinical gestalt to, to see how the patient's work of breathing is, to see how their um, blood pressure is, to see how their, um, you know, if that work of breathing has significantly improved or not um, over the first one to two hours, and then making a decision of where to go from there, okay? Um, but you should know, and if any of you have uh, experience with Vapotherm or other high flow technologies for hypoxic patients, you know really within about 15 minutes or so how they're going to do on that. And for, for the most non-COVID patients, honestly, I know within five to 10 minutes, I see that, that work of breathing rapidly improve. And that's what they're talking about. So if you're not seeing those improvements, maybe you're not seeing the numbers improve as much, but if you're not seeing that work of breathing improve, then you're going to want to consider doing moving on to other modalities. Um, now, You'll see at the bottom there that they talk about the the reasons to go to early intubation, and and those are pretty obvious, right? So if you have a patient who's profoundly hypoxic, who has all the hallmarks of, of severe COVID disease, maybe bad COVID pneumonia on X-ray or CT, if they have multi-organ failure, if they have that D-dimer greater than 1,500, or if they have their um, creatinines. Uh, approaching their age, it's probably a good idea to look at, um, at uh, more intense therapies like intubation. All right, so I think probably one of the more profound things and, and really how most of us are operating right now is based on um, Dr. Luciano Gattinoni's research um, coming out of Italy and Germany. So this is a guy from University of Göttingen in Germany who went in and was part of the frontline efforts in um, treatment of COVID in Italy. And it's fair to say he saw a lot of sick people. And what he describes in his writings is really two different phenotypes of disease, right? And so probably the most common and, and the patients that we are, not probably, but definitely the most common of the two are the silent hypoxemics, the type L patients, the patients that have um, uh, the low, the good compliance to their lungs, the patients that are, are walking in without overt dyspnea, but have O2 sats in the 70s and 80s, right? The patients who have low lung weight, so what, what does that mean? So their lungs aren't wet, they're not full of fluid, they're not RD, if you will. And the low recruitability really refers to that. So in a, um, in a lung that is um, more elastic and is snapping back, there's um, more recruitability that can occur, right? In those ARDS lungs that, that 
that PEEP is a significant concern. Well, these are not them, right? So um, the majority of the patients that are gonna present to your ER, present to your hospital in whatever fashion are gonna be the type Ls. And the recommended treatment there is to avoid the high PEEP environment, to avoid positive pressure treatments, to use the um, non-invasive measures such as high flow or high velocity therapies. And, and again, this is Italy. So we're talking about the helmet CPAPs, right? So that's how they manage them more successfully and, and how they were able to keep uh, a good number of patients off the vents. Now type H, that is your typical ARDS patient, right? That is your, um, hopefully you're not seeing a whole heck of a lot of them in the emergency departments, but these are the patients that require extended ICU care, that require ARDSnet treatment protocols, who have low lung compliance, who that have big right to left shunts and have heavy wet lungs with, who are very PEEP dependent and use different, will require different recruitment strategies to appropriately ventilate these people, right? So, most of the time, these are not patients that are being cared for, um, at least for a long term in, in the emergency department. Now, I, I won't um, speak for what they're doing in New York out of necessity, but um, most of these people in most of the country or most of the world are going to be treated in a critical care environment. All right. So... I know we've gone over this before, but so what do you want to do with the type L, the silent hypoxemics, the patients that have significantly low O2 sats? And that's to, to deliver high flow FiO2s, right? Or to, to, do, to deliver um, a significant amount of oxygen such that their patient, the patient sats uh, are maintained from 92 to 96% just like we talked about with the Whittle article, right? The nice thing about using high flow, high velocity is that the, the proning strategy, so the, the alteration of the patient's position to help improve the oxygenation is a whole heck of a lot easier than if they're strapped into um, like, a, like a CPAP mask or certainly if they're mechanically ventilated, right? So these patients on nasal cannula-based therapies are able to turn on their side. They're able to turn on their other side. They're able to to lay flat um, in positions of comfort where their work of breathing is improved, right? And um, they've seen that the, they don't tolerate positive pressure fairly well. They don't tolerate the high PEEP strategies. They don't tolerate the things that, um, that were being done early on when these patients were, were intubated early and treated as if they were ARDS. Now, there is a portion of these patients that, that go through a transition stage where the type L patients become type H patients. And, and, and that's really how you, you want to monitor those patients using the things like ROX index and your clinical acumen um, to make sure that they're not getting that heavy wet lung that needs to be treated with maybe mechanical ventilation or non-invasive positive pressure and high PEEP settings, um, and certainly going on to treatment uh, in the ICU under ARGENET protocols. All right, so initial recommendations to, to um, avoid high flow nasal cannula centered on the concern that people had about the aerosol generating procedure that high flow high velocity was. And they said, hey, you're given this huge jet of gas that's going into the patient and then refluxing out. How can this not be a significant concern to healthcare workers. And so let's look at that and, and really decide um, you know, how much at risk we are if we're gonna use these therapies. So first of all, is vapotherm, is high velocity, high flow nasal cannula therapy, is it an aerosol generating procedure? And the answer is, of course it is. But if you do anything to the patient's airway, that is an aerosol generating procedure. And we'll break this down and I will tell you my favorite papers with regard to this, but if you put a mask on a patient, that mask will shift. There will be leaks in that, and, and the difference being from high-flow, high-velocity therapies to mask-based therapies is you don't get a lot of lateral leak. Things don't go to the side. Everything comes straight out, and we'll see that here shortly. So, um, all right, so what, is, what are the things that you can do to protect yourself? Any patients that's, that is having an aerosol generating procedure ongoing, 
and and the most appropriate thing, first of all, um, is appropriate PPE for the staff. So before you ever approach these patients, you should have your particulate respirator on, your N95 with a good seal, right? You're gonna wear your glasses, you're gonna wear your gown, you're gonna have your gloves, maybe double gloved. And if available, if available, you're gonna use some sort of isolation room or negative pressure, right? So if you have HEPA filters, if you have negative pressure, that that's great. Um, of course, that's not always possible. And that's why, um, as we talk about some of the research that was done by Vapotherm, we looked at the worst case scenario, right? So if you have to take care of these patients in hallways or non-ventilated rooms, um, what is your risk? So um, there was a significant risk and all the talk was, hey, you can't use high flow, high velocity because it is an unnecessary risk to healthcare workers. And honestly, there that is like, it makes intuitive sense, but there is no evidence that supports that at all. And so, um, uh, what we're looking at here now is is a, a study of uh, bacterial pneumonia patients done by Long and others, right? So this is um, um, looked at gram-negative pneumonia patients that were were critically ill, ICU level patients, and and that was really the first study that looked at hey, what kind of stuff is coming out of these patients in this jet of of um, of gases. Um, on, from a patient on nasal cannula based high flow high velocity and what i would what i would ask of you is hey have any of you have any of you thought about this when you're treating patients with pneumonias or with uh, flu influenza or other viral pneumonias prior to this and I'll tell you, like, I haven't, like, I didn't do things to mitigate the risk for my, myself from putting a patient that I had, I knew had maybe RSV bronchiolitis and a kid or influenza pneumonia and an elderly patient or a combination of, the, of, of several different uh, things um, in, in the past. I've just never done it, right? Um, but the answer is, yeah, I mean, there is stuff coming out of them. Um, it is always wise to protect yourself. And what we will talk about is the easy way to protect against um, dispersal of, uh, of virus particles and other nasty stuff in, in the expelled air. So, um, all right, so this is Huey out of China. And they looked at, um, the air, the exhaled air dispersal from high flow nasal cannulas in comparison to CPAPs. And what I will tell you is this is not your typical CPAP. This is nasal balloon CPAP. So they looked at what the difference was, was with high flow nasal cannulas com as compared to um, nasal balloon um, interfaces for CPAP. And what they found was that, of course, both of them had uh, dispersal from the patient, but in terms of the distance that these particles, these aerosols flew, um, that that the high flow nasal cannula devices were significantly less. Of course, as you use increased amounts of pressure, um, then you'll get further dispersal. So our unit goes up to 40 liters. Some others will go up to 60 liters. As you move from lower flows, like an R as a therapeutic flow, is going to be about 25 liters per minute. As you move from 25 to 40, of course, your dispersal is going to get more. All right, and that's exactly what they found. Um, so. Um, all right, so this is probably, this is Tran et al. And this is probably the single best study that I've seen in terms of aerosol transmissibility. And what it is, is it says here analysis, but really it's a meta-analysis. They looked at a number of different studies and combined them to see what the odds or the, the odds ratios were um, for particle transmission for different techniques, right? So they looked at everything, a placement of a simple Venny mask or a nasal cannula or suctioning the patients. Um, and they found that a couple of things that were pretty, you know, I, I think pretty intuitive were the most risky of these procedures. And number one, far and away, the most risky patient uh, procedure to the healthcare workers in, in the tracheal intubation. 
non-invasive positive pressure was high because of the, the, the leap set in the mask and the shifting of the mask and the taking on and taking off the mask or the lifting of the mask for the patient to take um, sips of water or take their pills or whatever it is, right? Um, tracheostomies for obvious reasons, right? Um, coughing, gagging through that tracheostomy. And then manual ventilation, that refers to back valve mask. Um, but what they found, and, and kind of surprising, is that you know anyone that looks at odds odds ratios would know that numbers at one mean you know so if your your odds ratio is one, that means that there is no risk. And and numbers that are more and more negative or less than one would be negative. There, it is a negative risk factor, okay? So as we go to the next slide, and what I've shown you is that the high flow oxygen, even though it was just in one study, that there, there seemed to be no significant risk in terms of the aerosol procedures um, and risk to healthcare workers in terms of, you know, this looked at SARS, right? So patients on high flow systems and SARS. Um, and it, at the top of the list there, endotracheal intubation, all those, you see that number 6.6, .6, that's extremely high. Again, as you get more positive from one, those uh, that's a more and more risky procedure. So as you see, like if you look down the list to suction after intubation, that 1.3, so that is a little more, more risky. So it is a little bit more causative, if you will. Um, and then the high flow, of course, is is um, showed no significant uh, risk. So Tran has a nice um, there's a nice diagram and a nice chart in that. And if you pull that up, you can kind of separately download that chart, and it lists pretty much every um, airway intervention or anything that could be considered an aerosol generating procedure. And I kind of keep that handy, just so I know how to or to provide guidance. So you guys have heard that I'm an EMS physician. And so, hey, what, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna recommend in terms of uh, uh, what happens in the back of my ambulance for patient, for, for both the patient and, and for my crews that are maybe less protected than, than we are in the hospital? What are we gonna do in, in care settings, like say an X-ray or CT scan to protect our workers? Um, from from patients on these uh, different uh, uh, treatment modalities. All right. So um, where did this come from? All right. So or where did this go? So Tran in the SARS data. Where did this go? So the Australians and the New Zealand Intensive Care Society, their ANZICs, um, I think comes up with pretty good recommendations based on this. And and you see this is this is early March, okay? So this is kind of um, led into to, to a lot of what we're doing. And, and they recommend that high flow nasal oxygen is a recommended therapy for hypoxia associated with COVID-19 disease, as long as the staff are wearing optimal airborne PPE, right? Makes sense, okay. Um, and then they go on to say, and probably this first sec sentence is, is most significant, that the airborne transmission is low with any of the new or modern devices that are high flow nasal oxygen systems. So high velocity, um, high flow nasal cannula is what they're talking about. So any of your modern therapies that are doing this, not your, um, this is not talking about a nasal cannula, regular nasal cannula turned up to 15 liters or above. Uh, so um, what did we do here at Vapotherm to kind of bolster this data? Um, because, you know, I, I mean, a lot of this data was not all that robust. It wasn't that great. It was based on, you saw one cohort study on in the TRAN article uh, referring to high flow nasal cannula. So what did we do? But we went ahead and did um, computational fluid dynamic modeling. And if you look at the names at the bottom of this paper, Leonard, Atwood, Walsh, these are these are big names in, in Whittle, um, but they're all uh, working in collaboration with Vapotherm science and innovation researchers. And this paper was published um, by CHESS, so the Journal of CHESS Physicians, which is a pretty prominent um, uh, publication. And the, the first thing that they noticed, and what you'll notice in looking at these pictures is there's a heck of a jet of gas and high velocity gas that exits the, the patient on high velocity nasal oxygen, 
right? So vapotherm is applied to both the patients in these pictures here. And the flow on the left is because the patient has no mask on. The, the flow on the right is significantly mitigated uh, with placement of a surgical mask, all right? So simple surgical mask, this is an N95. This is simple surgical mask, which is basically what we should do for any patient coming to the emergency department, right? So if you just continue that and you put their, their vapotherm cannula underneath that mask, it is gonna significantly reduce the amount of particles that are flowing into the atmosphere, all right? Um, that mask has acted like a catcher's mitt. So um, it is catching all the particles and what you see in the next slide is that it does so very effectively. Um, on the left here, this is a patient breathing. This is just tidal volume breathing. This is you or I breathing without a mask, the kind of velocities that we generate out, okay? If you put the, the um, uh, patient on the far right there is the same as you and I breathing with a surgical mask, and you see much lower velocities contained in that, in that um, underneath that mask. And in 87% of the particles that we're exhaling are gonna be caught by that mask, all right? You put a patient on high velocity uh, nasal, um, nasal insulfation, you put them on vapotherm, you turn it up as high as you can turn it, you give them a respiratory rate of 40, and then you look at um, how much of that particles are be caught by that mask. And 83% of the particles are gonna be captured by that mask. Why is that? Well mostly because most of that velocity is directed straight out of the patient as we caught just like a catcher mask. Anything that is escaping has lost all its velocity. And the paper goes on to show that any deposition outside of the mask is gonna be in close proximity to the patient's face, right? Makes sense. Um, surprisingly, a patient on vapotherm at 40 liters a minute with a mask performed better than a patient at six liters nasal, simple nasal cannula with a mask. And I think, uh, you know, and, and, and again, I don't want to speak out of school, but to me, it's because that lower, that lower velocity coming out of the patient has a tendency to go laterally. And also there's no heat or humidity applied to a regular nasal cannula. And so there's more aerosol and less droplet, right? So Vapotherm provides 100% humidity. And so a lot of those aerosols are going to be caught up in droplets that will be caught by your mask. All right. So I think these recommendations, you know, they are right in line with the initial recommendations from the Chinese Thoracic Society that said, hey, if you're going to use high flow, high velocity oxygen, then you should be placing a surgical mask over the patient's face. All right. So, well, all right, what about, you guys are flushing the upper airway, you flush the dead space, you um, claim to ventilate, and of course we have, there's several papers that, that talk about that. Um, what, what kind of effect on, on ventilation um, does placement of surgical mask have? And, and the fact that you you're, there's going to be some rebreathing of that of your exhale gas does impact how effectively you remove CO2. And so you see here 37% reduction in CO2. What does that mean? Well, that means that again, a, a lot of those early recommendations were to reduce the flow rates. Hey, if you use 25 liters a minute, it has to be less risky to the healthcare workers than if you use 40 liters per minute. Well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. But if your patient is hypercapnic, if they are mixed hypoxic and hypercapnic respiratory failure, like a lot of our at-risk patients, our COPDers, um, then you actually, to get the ventilatory effects of the system, you need to start those patients higher. And that's why the, the CHESS paper really looked at worst case scenario in terms of a high velocity flush and the um, transmission risk associated with that. So maintain your, your flow rates high in patients that are hypercapnic uh, and titrate your flow accordingly. Titrate your FiO2 um, based on the patient's needs. All right. So what are the, what are the 
recommendations or their conclusions. Number one, and I can't say it enough, put a surgical mask over the cannula and that is gonna re reduce the transmissibility. Um, the surgical mask does somewhat affect the clinical efficacy. It's about 33%, less effective in terms of removing CO2, but that our lows should remain high because of it, all right? The surgical mask does not, does not eliminate the efficacy of the high velocity flush. All right, so um, what do we know about HVNI and COVID? All right, and so as we as we track down through these um, different citations here, we know that HVNI is for use in type one or hypoxic respiratory failure patients, as well as as well as type two or hypercapnic respiratory failure patients, and that was proven uh, in the Doshi article from 2018, which is published in Annals Annals of Emergency Medicine. So. We know that you can provide high levels of oxygen support. You can titrate FiO2 up to 100% of the patients, but that it is for spontaneously breathing patients, right? There may be some indication for using this as a way to bridge to, to um, intubating these patients or to use this um, in a uh, DSI, if you want to quote Weingart, if you want to use this for delayed sequence intubation, there may be some indication there. Um, we know that uh, hypoxic respiratory failure in, in COVID is extremely high, approaching 20%, right? Um, we know that um, our device will provide a modest amount of PEEP, right? And that is only during exhalation, right? So during inhalation, you, the flows of, of the, the high velocity flush are gonna, gonna approximate your peak inspiratory flows, right? So you're not gonna be breathing against a fan. You're not gonna have, there's not a continuous pressure like CPAP. But um, during exhalation, there's the, that flow is going to provide a modest amount of end expiratory pressure, which might help as your patients transition to sicker lungs, right? We also know that the warmed and humidified gas, which is approaching 100% humidity, is key to mitigating cough, um, secretions, to improve compliance, to improve um, the mucociliary function and the clearance of disease, and also to improve the comfort of your patient, um, which is going to go ahead and allow them to do the different things that you've asked of them, like like proning themselves, or um, and it's also going to allow them to, to, to take their medications or to eat and drink or to even converse um, with, with the care team. So when is uh, high velocity nasal insufflation? When is Vapotherm appropriate for COVID patients? And, and think of this in the continuum, right? So for mild to moderate patients that are gonna require oxygen, it does a wonderful job and, and is gonna be, uh, again, you can titrate your FiO2s from room air all the way up to 100% FiO2. In, in non-COVID experience, what I would tell you is if I have a COPD patient with some increased work of breathing that I put on Vapotherm, and maybe they're on two to four liters of oxygen at home, generally speaking, I, they do not require a lot more oxygen um, than that when even in their exacerbated state. So patients, um, you know, especially um, the type L patients we mentioned before that need oxygen alone, you're going to be able to titrate this all the way up to 100%. Symptom control. Well, these patients have thickened secretions. They have cough. They're short of breath. They're hypoxemic, right? Um, and 100% and heated, humidified, therapeutic gas, along with the oxygen that they need, are going to help mitigate some of those things. Now, post-extubation, really, again, not something that we think about in, in emergency department patients, but Listen, it's a win if you can keep a patient off a ventilator and on the on the front end, or if you can get them off sooner on the back end, right? So think about number of days in the ICU and the intense care that is required. And if you can save a day or two, or maybe a shift or two, and, and transition these patients out to the floor um, because you have high velocity nasal insufflation, that you can wean these patients, they're going to have less comorbidity associated with being on the ventilator. And it also, uh, they have a significantly reduced need for reintubation because of therapy that they're going on. 
So the nice thing is that you can titrate the therapy to effect. I mentioned that you can FiO2, you can, um, there's three settings. And if you look at the, the picture on the right there, there's three settings. The first is flow. You can titrate that. Our therapeutic flows are recommended between 25 to 40 liters for an adult. Of course, it's less for, for either really small patients or, or pediatric patients. And then their FiO2 can get, you get much better um, uh, delivery of oxygen than even over non-rebreather mass, right? So high velocity, high flow nasal cannula is going to deliver better FiO2s um, than non-rebreather mask. And uh, the nice thing is that you're going to deliver this at or about body temperature. So I don't know how that, you know, we, we talk a lot about of shifting the oxygen dissociation curve to the left with this disease, and that we know that temperature brings that back to the right. So maybe we're getting some benefit there as well, right? So typical range is about body temperature. I generally start my patients at 30, 37 degrees. Um, it will be less if they tend to have, um, if they're on home, home oxygen and are used to having that cooler um, stream of oxygen, they tend to like a little bit cooler um, settings. But really you titrate this to their comfort and, and how it's affecting the patient. And really uh, you're gonna know pretty darn quickly. So what kind of, what are we talking about in advantages? Like, why would you go to this? What is the advantage of using HVNI over BiPAP, CPAP, or, you know, the things that are all faithful in your department? And that is, it's easily tolerated. You, it's a nasal cannula, all right? There's, it's not anything more extreme than that. It seats on the patient's ears, just like a re regular nasal cannula. Um, it's a little bit louder. Um, but they can eat, they can, they can speak, they can move about if you have, um, you know, they, they can be moved to, to CT scan or they can move, be moved to the floor. So the ICUs, they can be moved to radiology, uh, wherever they have to go on the therapy without discontinuing it, right? And um, it's easy to secure the cannula to the patient um, and it's easy to see the effects very quickly. Um, we talked about prone positioning earlier and how advantageous that is in somebody with just a, a nasal cannula interface of high velocity nasal insufflation, right? So uh, proning is, is, and this is recommended for ARDS patients, but it's recommended for the more profoundly hypoxic patients, right? And so anecdotally, we've seen good uh, evidence coming out of New York and New Jersey of patients that are able to to alter their positions themselves while on these type of therapies. Um, and of course, if they're able to do that, if you can, can instruct them to do that from outside the room or from, from a greater distance, then it's gonna reduce the, the exposure to healthcare team as well, right? It's not something that you have to watch them uh, and, and uh, make sure, you know, other than making sure that the cannula stays on their face, it's, it's something that they can kind of move about relatively easy to their position of comfort. All right, so what about disinfecting it? Well, this is a big advantage of Vapotherm in particular, like even over some of the other high flow devices, right? So six total minutes, right? So each of these, each of these patients on, on Vapotherm has a single use patient disposable circuit. So you have a patient that's on it, they no longer need the device, you take their circuit out, you throw it in a biohazard bag and that's it. Right? You wipe the surface down of the, of the unit, you leave it wet for about five, six minutes, um, and that's it. And you pop a new circuit in and it's ready to go for the next, for the next patient. Some of the other devices require up to um, 55 minutes or more uh, of a cleaning or uh, disinfecting procedure for some of the high flow devices. Um, that is not needed for Vapotherm. Um, so again, really nice in, in terms of uh, labor intensity, you know, like if you were a therapist and had to clean this thing, six minutes is, a, um, you know, a whole lot better than, than spending an hour in PPE trying to clean another device. Um, so I know this has been a long um, and kind of uh, um, evidence intense talk, but uh, in summary, um, yeah, HVNI is now frontline uh, being used more and more in, in the management of uh, acute COVID-19, right? Um, it has a relatively lower transmission risk by comparing, 
com comparison to other ventilatory methods, whether whether you talk about non-rebreather masks, you talk about NIV treatments, or certainly mechanical ventilation. Um, of course, every patient uh, should have a surgical mask placed over the cannula, and, the, and any care team should be in appropriate PPE, as this is an aerosol generating procedure. Um, but it can be done with minimal risk to, to the caregivers. So um, that's a, that's it for the, the presentation. I really hope that you guys have some some questions and maybe some anecdotes uh, uh, how you've seen this work or maybe troubles that you've had. And go ahead and share them now, and we'll see if we can answer some questions real time. But I do appreciate this, and I know um, we at Vapotherm are really – um, trying to make ourselves available to to all your questions and all your needs as we kind of um, struggle through this really difficult pandemic. Um, and so uh, fire away. Wouldn't the patient removing their surgical mask increase clinician exposure for the patient to eat or drink? The answer to that is absolutely it would. But I think just like you and I don't keep our masks up 100% of the time, I think asking them to keep their mask on 100% of the time is probably unreasonable. And that is why cohorting these patients, you know, like several COVID positive um, vapotherm patients would be kept in the same area um, and why um, you're going to maintain your distance from these patients regardless, and also why you're going to be in full PPE if you approach them, right? So for the majority of the time, or if you're going to be at the patient's bedside, I would say that they need to be in surgical mask, right? There's, they're doing all kinds of novel things to communicate with these patients, right? They're getting their history by walkie-talkie or cell phone from outside the room. Um, but yeah, so if if they're eating, drinking, taking their pills, um, talking, I, I think it, it would be unreasonable to ask them to wear a surgical mask. And I think that they can take that down um, as long as care team is not in their immediate uh, vicinity. So that's the first one. Uh, approximately how much CPAP is generated at 40 liters? So this is going to be a little bit um, patient dependent, right, based on the size of their airways, et cetera. But we know that that it is a nominal amount. And I say nominal because it's variable in patients. And the amount of, uh, and it is not CPAP. So I will correct you there. It is end expiratory pressure, more akin to PEEP. And that's somewhere between three and six millimeters uh, of water pressure. So think um, think uh, PIPA five would probably be a good estimate. Um, next question: How often do you think we would need to change the mask? What about uh, airway temp? I'm guessing it would be more comfortable to use 31 degrees Celsius if they had a mask on. Just a thought. So I'll answer the the temperature question first. The temperature is really patient comfort dependent. So under a mask, yes, it feels a little bit warmer. They rebreathe a little bit more warm air and can perceive that a little bit more than having the cannula on and taking 37 degree flow in their nose. Um, I would say that you can titrate that just based on patient comfort. And, and so are you gonna lose uh, efficacy? And the answer is no. Of course, the nasopharynx is going to warm the, you know, warm some of the flow and and whatnot as well. So, um, I would, in terms of how often you would change the mask. Number one, just like our masks, if they're soiled at all, it should be changed. Uh, number two, I don't know that there's a good recommendation, but it needs to be in good working order. And so, I would say it would be reasonable to change it daily if they continue on. Uh, high velocity therapy, just for the amount of moisture um, uh, that's contained within um, uh, the mask over that time period. All right. And are there any differences between the variety of high flow nasal cannulas that we should be aware of? Any benefits to greater than 40 liters per minute offered in some? 
OptiFlow device, they mentioned OptiFlow in, in, in particular. Well, I, what I would tell you is that we did not build Vapotherm to be inferior to other devices by making it only 40 liters. The reason that I'm saying high velocity is that our cannula is designed and our machine is designed to provide a high velocity flow. Think of, think of a, a nozzle on the end of your hose that's going to speed the flow up that's coming from the wall. And the reason that we stop at 40 is that we're more efficient at doing the things that we do at 40 liters than some of the other devices are at 60 liters. Now, I will tell you that there is relative benefit to stopping at 40 liters when it comes to these patients. Number one would be the amount of oxygen that's consumed, right? So if these are onesie, twosie patients, not a, not a big issue in terms of the hospital's oxygen supply. But if you have a ward of patients on large amounts of, of flow, then it's going to be a significant demand on, this, on the system. Second of all, um, 40 liters versus 60 liters. So remember I talked about, hey, they were saying we should use lower flow rates um, in terms of viral transmissibility, right? So there would be a significant, a potential significant advantage in terms of what's coming out of the patient at 40 liters versus 60 liters. So um, yeah, there's, I mean, most of the time pre-COVID, we went around and we talked about um, the benefits of removing CO2 and, and how effective we are at 40 liters versus some of the other devices, even at at much higher flows. And that's because we're highly efficient um, using high velocity flows rather than just your high flow nasal cannula. What are some of the disadvantages or risks to using HVNI? Great talk. So what are some of the disadvantages? Well, number one, um, if we talk about New York City, let's talk about Elmhurst Hospital, kind of ground zero, if you will, for um, COVID. So they were kind of some of the first, uh, the, 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 the earliest surge, the most patients intubated and that sort of thing. Well, they, I mean, oxygen consumption was a real issue, right? As was um, the inability to segregate these patients, right? Like everybody had COVID. And so early on, maybe they didn't have uh, appropriate levels of PPE. Um, and, and so that would be a significant disadvantage. The other would be that um, I think in regards to the modality in general, um, you know, people are quite comfortable with BiPAP CPAP. And that's because we've been using it since the early 90s, right? So it really came to me when I was in my residency, and it, it was godsend to have BiPAP CPAP. And I think people are just, even though high flow, high velocity has been around for a number of years, I think people are just getting used to it. And so it's hard to surplant what your old faithful was um, with a new technology. Um, but I will tell you, I am talking to you today because I... I welcomed it in my ER with open arms, and it's really um, supplanted um, and any non-invasive positive pressure in, in my practice. How long does a patient with COVID-19 stay on Vapotherm on average? And I would say that is highly dependent on how sick they are. So there are patients that are on it for a day or two. There are patients that are on it for a week or two. Um, there are patients that are ICU level care um, and are maintained in the ICU because they have other comorbidities. Think of um, um, renal failures or other, other multi-organ failure that are associated with, you know, kind of sur sepsis um, or even patients that might have um, uh, significant uh, microthrombotic disease. And those patients are going to be, you know, they're sicker patients. They're going to be hospitalized longer and they, they maintain them on Vapotherm a lot longer. Of course, patients that may be extubated um, onto Vapotherm might, might have shorter courses than somebody who was maintained their whole hospital course on it. So I would say that it is not unusual for them to be on it for several days or a, a week or more. Right. So which, again, is a significant advantage. Right. So we are just starting to see patients that are extubated um, that were intubated like early in the course of our pandemic. So, again, I'll go back to Elmhurst Hospital. 
they intubated their per first patient, I think, on or around March 11th. And it was into early April before those patients were coming off vents. So just to clarify, HVNI can treat hypercapnia where standard nasal, high flow nasal cannula cannot. Well, I think, so I can't comment on what the other devices do. I can tell you that we in particular, Vapotherm in particular, has the Doshi study, which shows a non-inferiority to, to non-invasive positive pressure in terms of treatment of hypercapnic patients. So type two respiratory failure patients. Uh, all these studies in the um, in other manufacturers um, have been done in hypoxic patients or um, type one respiratory failure. So just to clarify, so all these things are going to provide flow that is going to flush the upper airway of CO2. So I would say that they probably do um, remove CO2, but we know to what degree ours does and can comment on that based on um, published scientific evidence. Uh, how would a provider be able to transport patient to CT or radiology on high flow nasal cannula? Does the machine need to be plugged in or does it have the battery to run on? Okay, so I will comment on our system and we have, Vapotherm has the Vapotherm transfer unit and that unit has basically three, a uh, couple of components. So it has, has a tank of oxygen, has a tank of medical air, which provides most of your flow. It has a compressor or it has a compressor with it. Um, and it has a battery to, to generate the power. So the answer is um, routinely these, these transfer units are used to move patients about the, about the hospital. But I will also say this, almost every um, place that has Vapotherm has a transfer unit. Um, can you restate the resources you use to stay current on COVID? I think the acronym, yeah, I will do that for you. So, so the acronym that I use, so EMCRIT, E-M-C-R-I-T dot org, is a site run by do, um, Dr. Scott Weingart out of Stony Brook, and um, his pulmonary um, cohort or colleague there is Dr. Josh Farkas. They run a COVID-19 update, and it is maintained real time. It also has um, uh, podcasts that go along with it. And then the second that I use is emrap, em colon rap, uh, dot com, and they do a weekly update on YouTube that is live, and you can ask questions, and that is every Tuesday night. Uh, it's 8 p.m. Eastern, but if you go to emrap.org, they have all kinds of different stuff on there. The third site that I use um, and and I, you know, I've been helping to keep them up to date with our stuff as well as Rebel EM. So R-E-B-E-L-E-M dot com, Rebel E-M dot com. Uh, and I think those are probably the best. And of course, um, ASEPT, uh, American College of Emergency Physicians, has a field guide that mentions the, um, you know, the ventilatory strategies and, and it is pretty comprehensive and is growing up by the day. So the ASEP field guide and, of course, the SCCM uh, surviving sepsis uh, campaign guidelines uh, are probably the best. Um, does Vapotherm assist with blowing off CO2? Yes. Um, so my job prior to COVID was in type 2 respiratory failure, so showing our efficacy and and spreading the word about the efficacy of Vapotherm and in particular the high velocity flush that Vapotherm provides in blowing off CO2. So Vapotherm um, is excellent and it is backed by the Doshi study which was published uh, Annals of Emergency Medicine, ASEPS journal. Is it possible to sterilize or autoclave the circuits to be used for another patient? I don't believe that's recommended. Um, they are single-use disposable units. They should go into trash, and a new one should be um, initiated for the for the next patient. Um, similar to that, so the, it's a circuit um, with a water bag um, and a a temperature control jacket that goes right to where it interfaces with the nasal cannula, and the nasal cannula would be fitted to the patient as well. 
there's really in adult patients there's really pretty much one size that you need the the um, there's an adult size and then there's a what's called pediatric adult small and that basically takes care of 90 percent of my 99 percent of my um, pediatric and very small adult think your um, cerebral palsy really small um, comorbid patients that you see in in the er so really i use only two size nasal cannulas so the next question is really good. Risk of infection of moisture retention in the tubing um, and any advice to, to avoid it. So one of the benefits of the single-use disposable system is that it is heated uniformly from machine all the way to patient interface, and it has a continuously flowing um, water bath that maintains temperature. And because of that, there's a lot less rain out. Um, also, there's a new there's a new circuit. So if you use the Aerogen um, nebulizers, I know we're not using a lot of nebulizers right now, but it, there's an intrinsic um, system where you don't have to touch the patient at all. The the aerosol goes right into the the specific circuit. So we actually have two circuits now. One is um, one has an intrinsic uh, Aerogen nebulizer in it so that your therapists don't have to be standing in front of the patient. So there is minimal rain out. That's the benefit of the Vapotherm system. Um, and, and so it, it is not really an issue. The other issue there is that this is a disposable circuit. You don't clean it at all. It goes in the trash. And are these non-intubated patients producing high levels of mucus and mucus plugging in their airways? like an intubated patient with COVID-19. Um, all right, so I'm not an intensivist. I don't bronch patients, but I can tell you that there's um, bronchoscopy is a significant aerosol general procedure. There are some patients getting bronch for mucus plugging and for other reasons, namely uh, bronchial alveolar lavage and diagnosis and that sort of thing. So um, it, do they produce mucus? Yes. Is it a high degree of mucus like some other infections? No. Um, are there differences between um, the phenotypes of patients that are intubated? Absolutely. Um, and I think this is really patient dependent, but mucus and mucus plugging has not been, it has not been, we'll say, at the forefront of what is causing their, their um, severity of their disease. What is your recommendation for a threshold for intubation? I recommend being a doctor. Okay, and so what does that mean? That, that means using all available information um, that you have. So the first thing I do is look at the patient's work of breathing. Um, I, it, if they're able to, un, you know, certainly altered mental status is a big one, right? So if you have a patient that is looking like they are gonna not be spontaneously breathing, they are not appropriate for vapotherm, right? You have to be, like, this is not, you can't set a backup rate. Um, to, to ventilate these patients with, right? So um, work of breathing, alteration of mental status, um, o falling O2 sats, increasing oxygen demand, all those things are gonna affect ABG results if you have them. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell out on any one thing. And I think that's what, what kind of happened early on is that they were sold, they were sold out on on this profound hypoxia and thought that, hey, I'm seeing a sat of 60%, I need to intubate these patients. And lo and behold, they found out it was just wrong. The slide said we should maintain SpO2 greater than, uh, no, it should say around, yeah. So it, it should say approximately 96%. So I think the recommendations are 92 to 96 from the Whittle paper, but they want a higher O2 sat. Um, what I will tell you more specifically is that hyperoxia, right? Like everyone knows that like ox oxygen toxicity is a thing and in particular in the ICU patients, um, but hyperoxia has really not been an issue with these patients. So um, err on getting their SATs up and providing an abundance of oxygen to their ill, ill, um, hemoglobin, right? So provide them an abundant supply of oxygen um, when you know that their hemoglobin are not functioning appropriately. 
Outstanding. Thank you so much, Dr. Hinckley. And thank you, everybody who joined us for this presentation. Uh, we appreciate you and we appreciate you spending the time uh, with us here today.